As a kid, I was always curious about how things were. So I would take any electronics that I was given as a gift and take it apart. And my parents would let me do that, so long as uh, there was an understanding that I would not use the common electronics that everybody else would use in the house. I'm Ibrahim Sisse, and I'm a biological physicist. I remember getting admitted to the physics PhD program at the University of Illinois, and I discovered a wonderful world of so-called single molecule biological physics. The ability to push microscopy so that you could detect fluorescence coming even out of individual biomolecules. When we talk about microscopes, most people imagine the traditional lab instruments to look at small samples. These work well for substructures that are a few micron in size or bigger, certainly larger than light's wavelength. But as structures get smaller and exist in closer proximity to one another, there is a real physical limit, the optical diffraction limits, which corresponds to about one wavelength of light that makes small structures unresolvable from each other. Superresolution techniques like Palm, Storm, and Stead overcome this limitation. For example, by capturing intermittently blinking molecules of a structure, we can process and assemble them into a final composite picture. While these techniques allow us to achieve much higher resolutions, they come at the cost of temporal resolution because it takes time to get enough detection to build a reliable image. So it's always been a conundrum for us in the field to figure out whether we can use the same super-resolution microscopy to also see substructures that assemble and disassemble very dynamically. And that is where the TC-PALM, time-correlated super-resolution approach that we developed during my postdoc comes in play. We can capitalize on the temporal information already existing in the data to infer on the dynamics of the assembly and disassembly of living substructures. And that is what led to the discovery of transient RNA polymerase to clusters in mammalian cells. The first step in gene expression regulation is transcription. That's when DNA is being decoded and copied into RNA transcripts. It's carried out by an enzyme called RNA polymerase II. What we decided to do was to see whether we can push the microscopy to see how the polymerase works inside a living cell. What we see was something that was a bit different from what the biology textbook was telling us. We started to see that this molecule, the polymerase, forms clusters, and the clusters are just there for a few seconds, so they form very rapidly and then disassemble also rapidly. We were then curious whether these very transient clusters had any role in the transcriptional process. So then when we push the super-resolution microscopy, we see that there is a linear correlation between how long the cluster is there and how many messenger RNA are coming out, suggesting to us that the cell may use this clustering of the polymerase to fine tune exactly how many messenger RNA can come out of the gene expression process. Why is that important? Even small mutations in this process can result in aberrant cell behaviors, things like tumors, in blood cells, diseases like sickle cell, or in brain cells, ALS, dementia, or Parkinson's disease. So the ability to understand biology at that fundamental molecular level really has the power to help us better understand how life works, and better yet, how subtle mutations can result in aberrant behavior that we see in diseases. What we can hope is that the approaches that we are developing can help us make the field more accessible, not just to physicists, but also chemists, biologists, and engineers all alike. The common knowledge of all these broad disciplines of sciences would be essential for us to understand the complex processes that we are trying to tackle.